Good. Start any time. Okay. Well, welcome, uh, everybody, and everybody that's uh, joining in via YouTube or any other method this evening. We'd like to uh, welcome you to our second meeting uh, as part of a two-part session uh, with some uh, vector control education. Um, we kind of started talking about this uh, over the winter, um, putting this together to uh, get our public more involved, uh, be more transparent, and then provide a lot of education on what our, our vector control program is doing. Um, we have uh, Rob S. Leeson with us from Airborne Vector Control. He is the uh, pilot um, that uh, runs the show uh, with our aerial spraying, and then we have Ben Prather with our Cass County Vector Control. Um, we really think it's important to, for our residents, our customers, to know how much work is being done throughout the city when it comes to our vector control program, and what we, we're learning and continuing to learn as uh, we uh, look at our event that took place last August, and how we're looking at how we can do, do things differently this, this season as we approach our summer. So uh, Ben Prather has uh, quite a lengthy presentation that he's promised to get through in a immediate way this, uh, this evening. So, and then we'll open it up for uh, questions and stuff like that. And I know that we have the ability for callers to call in this evening and uh, ask Ben some questions as well. So Ben, if you wanna take it away, I'll let you step up. Thank you, Mr. Dow. Uh, again, yeah, my name is Ben Prather. I'm the director of Cass County Vector Control. I've been the director at Cass County since 2009. Uh, previously, my experience uh, was in the Metropolitan Mosquito Control District. I was based out of the Maple Grove office uh, for about three seasons down there where uh, I was a field operations manager. And prior to that in college, actually, I worked for the city of Fargo and Cass County doing mosquito control. So uh, I'm creeping up on, um, you know, getting on 15 to 20 years of experience in and mosquito control in uh, 12, 11, 12, 13 seasons as director of uh, Cass County Vector Control. Um, I wanna just interject, <clears throat> this is the second of two public hearings that we've, uh, we've, we're hosting. Um, we do have a vector control board meeting tomorrow at Fargo City Hall. Uh, that is a Cass County Vector Control Board. Um, and that of course is open to the public and uh, we're gonna be discussing a handful of items through there, but the uh, previous 90-minute uh, open house that was held, um, it was back, what, two weeks ago now. Um, I went at length, maybe too far, uh, over 90 minutes approximately, where uh, discussing the specifics of the type uh, of application that was done, uh, some of the precursors and the uh, kind of the, the setup into those applications, as well as uh, some additional information on our primary uh, mosquito control activity, which is larval control of mosquitoes. And I'm probably gonna hit on a, a, a couple points uh, of that as we as we move through the, the slides today. But I really wanted an opportunity for the, the residents and the people online and elsewhere to uh, be able to offer questions. We only are, are offer commentary at, at a bare minimum. So my expectation is only to present um, anywhere from hopefully 15 to 25 minutes and really kind of hit um, at first, a, a kind of a genesis story, if you will, of of what um, how Moorhead, the city of Moorhead, became a contract partner with uh, the city of Fargo, the city of West Fargo, Cass County, Vector Control, and so forth, in the specifics of uh, of controlling mosquitoes in our metropolitan area, uh, and uh, really kind of start from there, and then hopefully leave uh, the remaining time open for a public Q and A. So, uh, all of my notes are online, as always. Um, we post. Uh, to our CassCountyND.gov uh, website. This will bring you right to a PDF for those who are in the audience uh, at home. You can go ahead and click those links uh, and find the slides uh, right along with you. And if you're in the audience and have a smartphone and wanna follow along, you certainly can uh, be my guest and scan that QR code and go ahead and, and move through it. So um, first things first, uh, again, the genesis story of what, what, how it came to be that Cass County Vector Control started performing mosquito control operations in the city of Moorhead. Uh, mosquito control in Fargo, um, West Fargo, Moorhead, is actually has a long history, a relatively unorganized history. Our original mosquito abatement district that was established in Cass County actually was not formally um, chartered, if you will, until 1989. Previously to that, we did have a series of uh, different kind of control programs with the 
um, sanitation or um, health department at the city of Fargo, uh, but it was really kind of helter-skelter during different years and different decades. Uh, the city of Moorhead, as the 90s, early 2000s turned around, um, started looking more in depth at mosquito control as a public works function and um, started introducing uh, essentially, you know, the, the early phases of what, what mosquito control is, primarily truck-mounted spraying, uh, larviciding where, where possible. And uh, as we, we phase through our, our, our business models kind of had the same path, so, so we did end up merging. But we'll get into that here as we move along. Again, for those at home in the audience, uh, I spoke 90 minutes on the specifics of the uh, application of August 26, 2020. Uh, I also go into significant detail into larval control, some of the budget, um, some of the different um, you know, protocols and procedures that we were following during that time. And uh, we want to, I got a water here, but I'll, I'll take it. So if you want the, the long story narrative with that, um, feel free to, to go ahead and uh, jump over to YouTube and the City of Fargo webpage. Uh, go ahead and click that playback speed to one and a half or two uh, so you can get through that 90 minutes. In there. Um, and, and we're really not gonna try and re-litigate re some of those, um, those points unless we're specifically asked questions. Uh, we do have, I do have all of those slides loaded in unison with the ones that we have here, but uh, um, we really wanna, again, make this an open forum and provide that opportunity for folks who want to, to make those comments. I think it's important that um, even before we get into the genesis and, and some of the specifics of the city of Moorhead, that we take the, the time and recognize that, yes, an event did occur on the 26th of August. Um, we did do an aerial application for adult mosquitoes once we were well in excess of our predetermined threshold for nuisance. Uh, during that time, there was a number of concerns obviously raised, uh, but during the course of numerous investigations across two state lines, four different agencies, there was no finding of fact of any sort of error. There was no um, challengeable you know, justification for the spray. There was no, uh, no error or malfunction in the equipment or anything. So uh, I think that's important for everybody just to, to acknowledge that um, through the course of this investigation, uh, these investigations that there was no wrongdoing or f anything that was found that was illegal um, or anything of that sort. As we've moved ahead from that particular event, uh, I have been in constant, frequent, you know, daily contact with a number of different organizations between advocacy, non-governmental organizations, American Mosquito Control Association is our national, um, uh, our national association for mosquito control, but also advocacy groups, uh, monarchwatch.org, um, Xerxes Society is an invertebrate um, conservation uh, group, and of course our local partners uh, throughout North Dakota, Minnesota, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife is it's kind of primarily been the, the key point of contact on our federal side of things. But we've had communications with uh, folks out of Fort Collins, Colorado, which is the uh, Centers for Disease Control Arbovirus Surveillance Unit, which is their mosquito, uh, their mosquito headquarters. And of course, um, this is probably presentation number five, I think, between all of the council meetings, commission meetings, and these public hearings that we have done. So part of those task force and those groups um, really are trying to identify a handful of things. Uh, really, there is a, a big void of information, uh, sadly, when it comes to monarch biology and behavior. Um, across the country, uh, professionals in you know, uh, entomology across uni university settings and these advocacy groups really don't have a detailed understanding of, of toxicology when it comes to pyrethroids and monarch butterflies. So uh, that has been one of the big challenges, um, not only for myself, but for many of these task groups is identify the subject matter experts, which is monarch butterfly experts, and really start that dialogue and open, open up some of those channels. And even then, there are very few that we're aware of at this point who we could you know, uh, lean on for absolute expertise when it comes to monarch butterfly migration behavior, so on and so forth. Definitely there's a need and an interest to look at a cross-discipline educational approach in terms of what is mosquito control? 
what is being done in, in Cass County, what is being done uh, throughout the nation as it comes to applying insecticides, placing products into the environment and trying to meet those objectives as well, because the folks who are from US Fish and Wildlife, the folks from monarchwatch.org and all of these other organizations are very unfamiliar with really the details and the specifics of the, uh, you know, maybe the nuance of mosquito control and the things that we do day in and day out. And uh, our processes and procedures, I think, are hopefully very illustrative for, for those agencies to at least be able to follow. Beyond that, we really look at kind of the unique characteristics of what we see here in the Red River Valley. Um, we really have a unique type of terrain compared to what you would see, you know, maybe in other regions. Of course, winter is a dominant season for us, but the uh, seasonality of our mosquitoes and just the voraciousness of them uh, challenges a lot of, of, of standards for folks who live on the Gulf Coast and uh, folks who are, you know, typically think they have bad mosquito problems don't really quite come to terms with uh, what really bad mosquitoes are like until they come to Fargo, North Dakota. So understanding the dynamics, particularly with the flooding of the river in late summer and early spring, uh, dealing with, uh, you know, a two inch rainfall in Florida really isn't a big deal, but a two inch rainfall here is a flooding event potentially for us if it comes down in a hurry. So understanding the dynamics of those types of situations is, uh, is important for that cross discipline understanding. And then look at, after all of these kinds of discussions, try and figure out what kind of results we're gonna get out of that and try and determine is there specific best management practices that could possibly be um, can, you know, drawn up for the basis of this? Is there pesticide label language that could be inclusive of, of this particular uh, species and different conservation of things? Um, and of course, uh, determine really what that effect on monarch butterflies uh, these pyrethroids have. I'd be amiss if I didn't uh, at least point to the evidence to rule out a freak occurrence. Um, that's something that we mention. We are not necessarily personally indebted to that. I'm not prescribing, um, you know, hanging my hat on that, that being as a, a realistic possibility. But if I don't mention that, it, it really kind of short sides the scientific discussion and debate that has occurred in tears above me in a lot of these different advocacy and, and uh, specifically the mosquito control side and the, the uh, pesticide manufacturers and saying that without absolute detailed studies and analysis on on specimens in the field um, there's no real chance to do that we're we're beyond that point here um, but that is something that the science is still still working for and and we're we're acknowledging that that as a whole but we're not necessarily um, you know going to live or die by that So back to where I said I would start. Um, these are kind of wordy slides, so um, you'll have to forgive me. There's not a whole lot of pretty graphics, but um, really just would like to tell the narrative of, uh, of how this came to be that Ben Prather, Fargo resident and director of Cass County, North Dakota, Vector Control is standing in, in the city of Moorhead today to talk about mosquitoes and monarch butterflies. So in 2014, um, the um, City of Moorhead Public Works Director had unexpectedly passed away. And uh, during that time, um, the City of Moorhead had operated its own unique mosquito control division, I believe, under their forestry department, where they had a handful of folks who were predominantly in charge of their, their truck spraying activities. Um, we integrated with them during different meetings and, and different emails to try and uh, coordinate some of those plans of attack so that we would have somewhat of a uniformity of, of coverage. And we also um, shared an aerial applicator given that we have something like 30 or 40 miles of combined um, of shared border between the North Dakota and the Minnesota side. But upon his passing, there was, um, there was definitely some challenges for the folks in the city of Moorhead and having that pool of knowledge vanish on them was, um, was a challenge for them to overcome. So they, they did come to us, uh, the city administrator at that time, uh, the forester and others, and said, look, we know, we see what you guys are doing, we've interfaced a lot. Is it gonna be possible for us to join forces and create some sort of metro-wide mosquito abatement process? And at that time, it was, was not necessarily clear that that was even, even going to be realistic, given that oddly, uh, pesticide regulations between two states and licensure between two states is 
is actually a little bit more dynamic than you would think. Um, we share a SWAT team, but uh, mosquito control, um, sharing resources across the river was a huge, a huge challenge for the folks down in St. Paul for that. But nonetheless, we started on this process of this joint operations of, of a, of a community-wide, um, very consistent mosquito abatement district that was led predominantly by Cass County Vector Control under the guidance of the Vector Control Board, under the guidance of our municipal leaders in Fargo, West Fargo, and Moorhead. Uh, and since 2015, um, we have essentially provided all of that service uh, for the folks in the, the, the city of Moorhead, uh, concurrent with, uh, with our operations on the Cass County side of the river. So we do approximately, I'd say somewhere about 200 square miles, and I have that specific math um, deep in these slide decks, but uh, including the city of Moorhead, which is approximately 20 square miles, we have about another 180 that we are performing larval control uh, applications in um, to, to hopefully eliminate as many larval mosquitoes as possible. Um, so adding on the additional 20 miles uh, 20 square miles was not was not too terribly dramatic. Upon this road, of course, um, lots of approvals, lots of discussion, uh, lots of challenges that were undertaken in uh, my presentations across uh, a number of boards, commissions, committees, you name it, in order to to really get this uh, on on track and, and moving ahead. Starting in 2014, we started doing some of the adult mosquito surveillance. We actually assumed all of the trap collections, all of the adult speciation, the separation, where we're quantifying how many mosquitoes we're seeing per night, translating that out to our threshold counts and kind of identifying those times where a um, some sort of intervention was necessary. So 2014 was really that first trial period um, to see, you know, can we focus or you know get together on on unifying our trap collection process and then pivot into 2015 where now Cass County Vector Control is driving our trucks across the river with our Minnesota pesticide license uh, in tow and making applications of uh, public health insecticide. So um, I've mentioned licensing a, a few times. Um, I do like to point out it's a little bit of a a little bit of a, a, a point of pride for me in that of our 42, 43 seasonal staff that we employ every year, our first year employees not only receive their pesticide certification in the state of North Dakota, they also receive that same certification. They retest, they have a new exam that's proctored in, in Moorhead, and they have to be certified in the, the state of Minnesota as well. So in terms of the training and the time and the investment that we put into our often very young staff um, is extensive. Um, most people maybe don't quite understand that as a government agent or as anybody who is paid to apply insecticides, herbicides, and so forth uh, uh, through a municipal government, we are required, um, it is requisite, that we hold a, a pesticide application license in a specific category for that unique state. So um, logistically, we could have reciprocal agreements with North Dakota, Minnesota, but there are edge cases that don't make that really useful. So in, in light of all of that, just to stem off any confusion, we go and make all of our first year employees certified pesticide applicators in North Dakota and Minnesota within their first month of employment. Uh, typically, the whole process of training and, and uh, getting people up to speed anywhere from you know, five to 10 days, sometimes 12 work shifts, I should, I should stipulate. Um, so before we're uh, actually sending staff out in the field before, you know, they're fully autonomous, we're, we're upwards of, you know, what, $120 a day times 10. So we're spending, we're spending significant funds as required by law for us to get these folks certified and, and ready to go. This is a somewhat unique partnership um, there, as far as my understanding goes, there are no other mosquito abatement processes that are that mirror what we do here in Fargo, Moorhead, and West Fargo. For the most part, uh, folks see these state lines as a strict boundary for at least regulation. Um, I can assure you, mosquitoes do not uh, have any sort of uh, 
uh, observation of jurisdictional boundaries in our you know 75 foot wide river uh, corridor it really doesn't do much to to halt that migration so um, it's absolutely necessary for our success of both sides i would say um, that we rely upon each other even though that is a um, fairly novel or unique arrangement for us to to engage in let's see uh, and with that you know we do have extreme maybe some of the hiatus oversight of any mosquito control district in North America, given that we're operating in two unique states across a number of different municipal jurisdictions. Um, some places in, uh, in the country, you look at Texas and elsewhere, they are municipal level programs. Um, each city that you cross into will have a, a mosquito control crew and a, a field, um, you know, a, a staff of, of people who are out in the field doing larval control and adult mosquito control. Um, but, um, but for us, we, we were fortunate enough to, to have these agreements. I think uh, inside of that even, you know, below the state regulatory schemes that we're dealing with, we also have a, uh, a very effective, uh, but somewhat uh, extreme uh, internal control system where we're operating under the guidance, not only of the Cass County Vector Control Board, we're working with the city of Fargo, directly we're getting authorization from the city of west fargo and the city of moorhead specifically um, is required to give a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down on any adult control application those typically come in at least 24 hours and often um, days in advance of when we think we're going to need need a particular application and that that certainly was the case of the august 26th aerial application uh, and during that that whole process, and I have a, a very detailed kind of flow chart we can skip to if there's questions, um, we did receive authorization. We had met our uh, due diligence with our justification. Um, our thresholds were well exceeded. Uh, we had seen, um, you know, huge, huge numbers of mosquitoes in, and we did receive approval across the board from all of those entities. So this was not one thing that was done by decree by myself or anybody else. Um, there were literally probably close to a dozen dozen people who uh, who concurred with this and uh, agreed upon this operation. It's also, I think, uh, important to point out that the Cass County Vector Control has an aerial contract with our, our vendor and our supplier. The city of Fargo has a contract with our aerial applicator supplier. The city of Moorhead has a contract with the aerial applicator. So. Uh, it's important to note that we, we don't stand necessarily in between there. Yes, we're kind of in the middle, uh, but we're kind of out of those lanes. If, if there is any, any challenges or if there are any questions, concerns, objections, um, it really becomes a, a discussion between each municipal player and the, the airborne, uh, our, our aerial contractor. So specifically the language over the past five years, we've gone through five contractual years uh, operating with the city of, of Moorhead. Um, we had two one-year agreements uh, for larval control and, and adult control, kind of the full bang of, uh, of uh, process and procedure. But we did an actual uh, three-year agreement that was 2018, 2019, and 2020. Logging up here. And in all of these contracts, the language did stipulate what I just said, more or less, that the, the city requests the services of the aerial applicator, meaning that they need to authorize in writing whether or not we're gonna be doing a specific spray event on a certain night under certain conditions. And there has been times when an individual municipality has been able to, uh, or has spoken up and said, hey, this is not right. We've got something going on. We have concerns. Um, let's maybe try and postpone it a day or two or, or what have you. And, and we've worked that out. Um, internally in our process. So I covered a lot of these um, in the lead up to this, uh, but there, um, I kind of want to get into the specifics uh, of some of these things in that. I know when we, we assumed this agreement and we, we took this on um, at the request of uh, the folks here in the city of Moorhead, there definitely was some major challenges um, uh, coming from their citizens. And that is, I think, was the, the big challenge was is that 
Fargo's doing all this. They're in the news a lot. Uh, West Fargo's mosquitoes are great, and, and really there was some challenges to the status quo on you know whether or not more could be done. I can't speak specifically to um, exact totals or a t number of pounds of larvicide that were applied in, in the city of Moorhead or how many times they truck sprayed. Our correlation really was more or less kind of limited to are they truck spraying and do they want to do an aerial spray in conjunction with us? Those two, two items were most significant to us. Outside of the scope of that, um, it, was, it was relatively limited um, in terms of very uh, specific nuance uh, when we come into this. After um, we started you know, these discussion, it was pretty obvious that uh, we're one of the few, if not you know, within 100 miles or so, um, of mosquito abatement districts that have the capacity to, to work on the scale that the city of Moorhead would, would require. Um, of course, Grand Forks has a dedicated municipal program um, with several hundred thousand dollars in, um, you know, based out of their public health department. The city of Wahpeton has a, uh, a few man crew, uh, maybe two or three folks who are, um, you know, work with their parks district and so forth. But really it was pretty obvious, I think for all of us that the city of Moorhead comes and, you know, says, well, what can you do for us? Is this possible? There has been, um, I've mentioned maybe um, earlier in the, the discussion, years of discussion of whether or not there should be a metro-wide or a cast clay uh, mosquito abatement program. And um, I have that actually included, um, I have a slide popping up here, but I brought my very own copy uh, that uh, the folks from the Metropolitan Council of Government um, turned up that was dated in 1989. And this actually goes into very elaborate and great detail in regards of not only the, the function of the agreement that would be served, but also the specifics of what mosquito control was like in 1987. And in fact, this, agree, um, this abatement plan predates the formulation of um, the Cache County Vector Control District in itself. So uh, definitely um, something to look at. I do have a slide that, that provides that information, but um, the long story with that is we're, what, you know, over 30 years since that was formally pitched. I can tell you anecdotally, these discussions had occurred in the 60s, 70s, and 80s as well. Um, specifically, there was a massive outbreak of what is called the Western equine encephalitis virus, which is actually um, the Flavi virus, which is like West Nile uh, virus and similar in that it uh, predominantly is spread through birds and uh, um, actually is very harmful for horses. But Western equine encephalitis in the 70s and 80s um, required some massive interventions. Um, working with people out of the Twin Cities, uh, when, I, when I came down there in 2007, a lot of them had fond recollection of, oh yeah, you know, 30 years ago, there were this huge mosquito-borne outbreak in the city of Moorhead and Fargo, and, and uh, they actually um, uh, mobilized folks from the Twin Cities to come up here to assist in this particular mosquito-borne disease. And during that discussion, um, you know, we, you know, this option of a, of a community-wide uh, abatement district really came into came into formulation. I will mention um, just briefly that even this 1987 mosquito abatement plan encourages and endorses some component of uh, aerial application, both on emergency basis and non-emergency basis. So they were very astutely aware, um, even in the late 80s, that mosquitoes both cause a threat to human health, uh, but also are a significant nuisance in a um, a hindrance on the quality of life uh, for us here in our short summer months in the uh, Upper Great Plains. Again, um, here's the link to that. I had, uh, had some folks in my office uh, scan my copy here. I'm sure there's a real original somewhere else, but uh, for me, it's a good read. I think it's like 90 pages or something like that, but uh, um, definitely kind of humorous when they're, they're talking about spraying, you know, essentially fuel oil mixed with Durban and some of these really heavy organophosphate insecticides that were common during the time. Um, we've moved well beyond uh, most of those active ingredients into things that are either um, 
a synthesized molecule based on uh, organic chemistry or uh, our biologics, um, bacterial insecticides. But if, uh, if any of you folks have an interest with that, um, go ahead to cascountynd.gov um, 87. It's map. I put mosquito abatement plan just to make it a little easier to add. So the big question, I guess, for us is, is, well, why does Cass County have an invested interest in doing this? And what's the specifics of, of our relationship in this agreement? And one is that when you look at the total number of residents in Cass County, North Dakota, the city of Fargo, and so forth, something like 60% of the population of Cass County, North Dakota, lives within one mile of the city of Moorhead. We're not talking about you know the nearest bridge or anything like that, but my house over on 9th Street in Fargo is less than a you know you know I can ride my bike here and back and not really even break a sweat even on a hot summer's day. So really for us in uh, in Cass County, you know we look at this as a as an opportunity for you know not only to you know help our fellow Cass County residents, but to be able to provide the same service across the river for quite frankly zero financial incentive for Cass County Vector Control or any of these other agencies. Uh, our agreements are set up in such a way that um, it is mutually beneficial purely on the result of the mosquito control operations uh, that are being performed in the city of Moorhead. And, and clearly mosquitoes, like I mentioned, aren't going to stop on the Red River and say, well, I got to turn around. This isn't where I'm from. Um, quite frankly, we see flight ranges of mosquitoes in our region in different scenarios um, go well in excess of 10 miles. We've had rainstorms south of Sabin, Minnesota, and no rain in the metropolitan area, and have seen massive um, deviations from our normal conditions that exceeded threshold and required treatments and so forth. So um, that definitely is something that we see. Mosquitoes do fly. It's not like they hatch and they stay put. Um, they are moving and mingling around. Another, you know, benefit for us is that we do really pride ourselves on our larval control efforts. Um, when you look at our total outlay of products, outlay of our um, man hours uh, throughout the course of a season, approximately 75 to 80 percent of all of those efforts, all of those tax dollars, are spent in the effort to kill larval or immature mosquitoes in standing water before they become adults. Unfortunately, that doesn't always, um, that's not a you know, cure-all for all situations. And um, maybe I'll jump into the integrated pest management slides here in a little bit. But the agreement with Moorhead allows us to extend that reach to apply those products um, that we've been using for decades now um, and hopefully getting the same effects uh, um, for our residents as we do with our colleagues over here in Moorhead. Let's see. Um, I mentioned, um, and I'm not sure if Mr. Molly has specifics on this, but the primarily, um, from my understanding, in, in the early 2000s, up until 2014 or 2015, um, I believe there were two staff members assigned to mosquito control. Um, we'd have to go through some budgets or payroll stubs or something like that, but that number sticks, sticks in my head as, as fairly clear that during any one season, any one summer, uh, we would see, you know, just one or two people um, who are out doing larval control, adult control, surveillance, and so forth on any any one given day. Uh, looking at 2020, uh, we have looking at 2020, our daily per uh, our daily employees per shift in Moorhead. Uh, almost was six. So not that we had six people there for their entire shift, but we had at least six staff members applying product, punching in more or less, punching out with, with the, within the city of Moorhead. And we're doing that with the, the same amount of budget dollars as we were doing uh, with two folks uh, in, that same, in that same role. Um, and with us, we bring a fleet of all-terrain vehicles. Um, we have... Uh, we dedicate seven truck-mounted sprayers uh, specifically for the city of Moorhead uh, for our, our UOV operations. So we're able to bring a significant scale that was uh, previously 
uh, unavailable uh, to, to the city of Moorhead. And uh, those additional five or six employees only really represents, you know, just under 20% of, of our total staff. I mentioned, you know, we have uh, close to 50 employees when you add in the full time. So when we're talking adding in, you know, three people to work in the, the backyards and an ATV crew that's driving around and doing right of way treatments, um, we're, we're really um, making the use out of every dollar that we get. And I, I feel like we're doing that pretty efficiently. So as a comparison, um, I wanted to take just a brief look at revenues and expenditures and some of those things, um, specifically through the light of the city of Moorhead and, and discuss the specifics of those contracts and, and how those things, um, or how those numbers add up in comparison to some of the other operations. And um, you can see the Moorhead contract, get it again. Moorhead contract this last year was approximately $111,000. So we build those every month um, pretty much at the uh, end of May, end of June, end of July, and then actually um, at uh, the end of uh, September, um, just to kind of catch that, that tail end. And we bill for essentially time and materials. So every pound of product that we apply, um, we're recording that. This, the laws of the state of Minnesota and North Dakota uh, require us to um, really understand where that product is and who applied it and what conditions there are. So that's that's relatively simple. Uh, and then also uh, tabulating all of those staff hours that were expended uh, through the course of uh, that previous month or that that interval uh, billing cycle. And um, we are actually, we do add um, payroll taxes, uh, social security, uh, workers' compensation, some of those things just so the Fargo cast player, uh, Fargo and Cass County taxpayers aren't, aren't screaming at their computer screens right now. So uh, we feel that, um, you know, we're, we're very narrow. We're not, we're not adding a whole bunch of pork onto these things. We do charge, again, for time, materials, payroll taxes, um, and we do have a $5,000 per month administrative fee, which covers not only equipment, it covers fuel, it covers personal protective equipment. We require N95 masks for some of our materials, and the uh, uh, gloves, nitro gloves, um, and then, of course, administrative tasks. We talked about the 20 plus hours of, of training um, in class, plus probably 20 hours in the field of, of training. And then at least, I would say, anywhere from four to maybe eight hours of, of actual test taking and certification. So that $20,000 admin fee, we're stretching as, as thin as we possibly can um, to, uh, to provide these benefits. But in general, uh, a big bulk of our budget is not based in the city of Moorhead. Uh, the city of Fargo larval control contract uh, is, is approximately $280,000. Uh, and the city of West Fargo is, is somewhat less and really kind of based upon that administrative fees. The important thing for our Clay County, County residents to understand is that the taxpayers in, this, the, in Cass County, North Dakota, the city of Fargo, uh, are paying kind of twofold, if you will. So um, the city of Fargo, the city of West Fargo, the city of Horace, um, Harwood, a lot of these municipalities uh, seek additional funds through their enterprise funds. So uh, you, you go up to um, Harwood, North Dakota. They have, uh, you know, of course, a, a sanitary sewer. They have water and so forth in there. And they include some kind of fee for mosquito control uh, typically operations with us or potentially uh, operations with Airborne Custom for adult mosquito spraying activities. That is in excess of what they are actually paying on top of their property tax. So we, uh, we look at it kind of as an operational budget and then more or less a capital slash full-time employee budget. So when we're billing out these hours or billing out these applications, um, you know, we're looking really at time and materials of field work. The remainder of this, of course, is it's, it's expensive. We have over, I think we have 13 side-by-sides. We have something like eight trailers. We're over 40 vehicles. Um, we have 
including five sprayers from the city of Moorhead. I think we have 30, we'll have 33 truck mounted sprayers, which is the largest fleet in all of North America uh, when it comes to truck mounted spraying uh, uh, capacity. Uh, and all of that takes a significant overhead. Um, for Fargo residents who are maybe watching this as well, uh, part of this is an aerial application budget for the city of Fargo. This covers all of the fuel for the city of Fargo, city of West Fargo. This also um, is kind of the non-tangibles of, uh, you know, the PPE like we were talking about. Um, uh, of course, uh, you know, gas and, and some of these other things. So it's maybe not as dire as, as you would think. And of course, all of our uh, payroll taxes, uh, we are not billing to the city of Fargo, the city of West Fargo. So we are cost sharing um, all of that. So um, that isn't directly, that's not my paycheck or, or my uh, full-time employee's paycheck that is really evenly distributed um, as the kind of the overhead cost per application per employee. So diving, diving even further into that, just to, just to say we love you Fargo and West Fargo, um, a big bulk of those county property taxes that we receive are predominantly from the metropolitan area. So we're really dominated by, you know, our, our big cities, our property taxes are primarily focused, you know, in, in, our, in our big populated areas. That's um, not too big of a stretch to imagine, but uh, the bulk of our budget, uh, over half a million in property taxes, uh, and you add in the, the 280,000 in, in the operational funds, we're upwards of three quarters of a million dollars uh, for our residents in the city of Fargo's contribution, which we thank you greatly uh, for supporting us uh, all these years but shows um, some of the budgetary challenges that, that do really exist. Uh, I know speaking with residents from the city of Moorhead, city council members, um, you know, there really are some expectations for things that haven't really been discussed beyond, you know, a theoretical possibility. Um, when you break it down to, okay, well, what will this cost us? Um, I think there, there definitely are some discussions that the folks in the city of Moorhead really need to um, acknowledge and, um, you know, take a, Take to heart that there will be some some financial responsibility that um, is incumbent upon them. So, um, I had to stop here for questions, um, and I think I'm 40 minutes. I said 25, so times two. Go figure. Um, I do have detailed explanation, detailed questions from Q and A that I've had um, over the last well six months now. That um, if there aren't very many questions, we'll we'll kind of work through some of those or maybe we'll go through and refresh some of the slides um, that we presented last week. So with that, Mr. Molly, is there um, anyone from the audience uh, that would like to, like to make a comment? Am I on? Thank you. I've My name is Ron question. Miller. Ron Miller. I'm retired from medical practice the past few years. I've spent about 50 years in medicine and 40 years in Fargo. For about 10 years, I was the director of the Merit Care, then Sanford Travel Clinic, pediatric travel clinic. I'm a pediatrician. I've cared for a lot of children and adolescents with the virus. And uh, I would recommend to all of you to look at the cdc.gov and the North Dakota Health ND.gov as resources for West Nile virus and its management. I have a different look at this, obviously, than the CDC, and I come at it from a different angle. West, West Nile virus, as we're all pretty well aware, I would think, is a mosquito spread illness that has been in the U.S. since about 1999. Uh, prior to that, it was only in the West Nile area of Africa. Birds are a major host, but like humans, horses, dogs, and cats can be infected. Humans are a dead-end host, pass out of you to another person. West Nile virus is known to be sporadic in its outbreaks and widely dispersed in the U.S. Fatal cases are much more likely to occur in those over 75 years of age and those with significant comorbidities like heart disease and lung disease. Clearly, if you get West Nile virus, it's not fun and it can be terrible. 
but many people who get it don't even know they have it, just like happens actually with COVID. For each person who develops West Nile virus, who has neuroinvasive disease, which is a severe form, there's about 300 to 700 individuals who will have non-neuroinvasive disease. Many people never see care because they're fine, not sick, they don't even really know they have it, and it's only found through routine screening, like for giving blood in a blood donation that you find out that they have it. There is no drug for West Nile virus, and there's no human vaccination for it. There are vaccinations for horses. There are two ways to manage it. One is the individual driven prevention of mosquito bites, and the other is community driven prevention of mosquito bites. The CDC and the North Dakota Department of Health offer many suggestions in, under the category of personal responsibility or individual driven prevention, which include the use of DEET, permethrin on clothing, you can't use permethrin on your skin, avoiding being outside at dusk and dawn, avoid using use proper clothing, cover yourself up, keep mosquitoes out of your home, drain water on your property, use products like Thermacell, keep the mosquitoes away from your yard, backyard. Homeowners then could choose not to have spraying by aerial spraying, but could choose to do it by a backpack sprayer done by a professional pest removal company. There are actually eight companies who do this work in the fargo Morad area. The cost is then borne by the homeowner, not by the city or county. To understand the science of community-driven prevention, which would include aerial spraying, is not a straightforward one, but I want to review it did here. To start this off, you have to have a little bit of a short course in evidence-based medicine. Evidence-based medicine is an interdisciplinary approach which uses techniques from science, engineering, biostatistics, and epidemiology, such as meta-analysis, decision analysis, risk-benefit analysis, and randomized control trials to deliver the right medicine to the right, in the right time, to the right patient, in the right place. Evidence-based medicine can also be used to make public health medicine recommendations. Using evidence-based medicine, I evaluated several studies to get a feel for the use of ultra-low volume spraying, which I understand is an industry standard. Ultra-low volume aerial spraying covers most mosquitoes more than, say, ground spraying would. Two studies. There's a lot of studies to show that the use of aerial spraying to prevent malaria in equatorial Africa is helpful, but those are not helpful here because we're not treating malaria. We have West Nile virus. Studies relating to mosquito population reduction are marginally useful. In other words, that's not the target. The target is not how many mosquitoes you get rid of. The target is, can you make a difference in human disease? No study I reviewed using ultra-low volume aerial spraying efficacy addressed the type of severe aesthetic collateral damage or the Monarch Massacre we saw last August. Studies reviewed generally show ultra-low volume spraying of permethrin and pyrethrin as safe for humans and say dogs and horses, but not so much for cats or fish. There have been several studies done in densely populated urban areas, for example, Dallas, Texas and the Sacramento Valley of California, that show less neuroinvasive West Nile virus with aerial spraying of permethrin. Research like these studies involve complex formulas such as incident rate reactions, patient ratios, and that measure West Nile virus causes pre and post aerial spraying. For example, studies on the efficacy of a new antibiotic used to control the hospital population of patients who are sick would be better done in a hospital. There's much more control over it. There are many anecdotal reports of improvement in the backyard barbecue comfort factor. It seems to improve your backyard abilities. Personal stories of West Nile virus tragedy should not influence public health policy. Although it is hard to not be affected by these stories, they are profoundly tragic, but they are not scientific. Sad, each story, as each story is, these stories are anecdotal and not evidence-based medicine. Many arguments to do aerial spraying are a red herring fallacy. We're presented with lots of irrelevant information that cause problem at hand. Take a look at the North Dakota Department of Health studies, statistics on how much disease we have. North Dakota in 2019, we had nine cases. In 2018, 200 cases. 2017, 62 cases. 
2015-24. Move on, look at Cass County. 2019, there were no cases of West Nile virus disease reported. In 2018, there were 16 cases. In 2017, there were four cases. And there have been many years in the past 10 years where there were no cases of West Nile virus. So there's no North Dakota health differentiating of a reported mild case versus a neuroinvasive case. So a case that's reported on the North Dakota Health website could either be somebody who is mildly ill or could be somebody who is really sick. There's just not a lot of neuroinvasive disease, certainly not even a lot of West Nile virus. The target endpoint is really not mosquito population. The target endpoint should really be dimension, dim, diminution of human disease. So both CDC and North Dakota Department of Health have excellent websites. North Dakota Department of Health statistics show many cases, years where cases of West Nile virus are minimal to non-existent without aerial spraying. Except for epidemic, not pandemic, but epidemic years, West Nile virus remains a health concern, but not a major public health crisis. It's hard to predict when and where any given year there will be an epidemic spraying, but there are actually tools for this, as you're probably aware of. North Dakota Department of Health statistics for Cass County do not differentiate cases from rural Cass versus urban Fargo. Aerial spraying does kill adult mosquitoes, but the effects on populations of adult mosquitoes is short-lived, as you know. And in a few days, there's the mosquitoes back again. There are really so few reported cases in North Dakota of West Nile virus that it's hard to imagine any intervention actually showing improvement. Use of ultra-low volume spraying, highly dense populations may be effective. There's very little likelihood you can have transferable information from Dallas, Texas to Fargo. So those are prepared remarks. And I, is that a Sir, I wholeheartedly agree with every statement you've made. Um, I would suggest in the same resources that you've discussed with the Centers for Disease Control, there is full-throated endorsements of mosquito and aerial applications for those types of controls. And I'm glad, I'm glad that you uh, decided to show up today because I do um, want to take a look at some of your op-ed positions that you've taken. Your observations, um, quite frankly, are false. You say that there are no children that have been affected by West Nile virus. That is patently a false statement. There have been children who are affected, but they uniquely don't get as sick as adults do. The target population that is an incorrect statement as well. Let's look, at another, let's look at another fact that you propose is uh, another statement you purport as fact. West Nile neuroinvasive disease is endemic. We have one of the highest incidences of neuroinvasive disease of West Nile virus in North America, ergo the world. You can go to places in Africa that have less West Nile neuroinvasive disease than what you see in Cass County and in our surrounding regions. The other statement that predominantly that we have are cases of West Nile virus not occurring in the metropolitan area is woefully uninformed. The data that we're privy to uh, provides us the ability to look at what is HIPAA protected information. And I can tell you with no hesitation, West Nile virus does occur in children in the city of Fargo, in the city of West Fargo. I would agree with that. It does happen, but they just don't get very sick with it. That is also incorrect. Okay. Rob, do you want to? Let's yeah, I have Mr. If your end goal is to help pollinators, when you're putting out permethrin um, as a residual spray, you're actually doing more harm than you would as a ULV spray, whether that be by air or by ground. So my question is, is what's the end goal? Well, the end point is, can you do, 
increased West Nile virus disease. I don't think that's been shown, and I'm not sure you can because there's so few cases. The only way the cases look high here is because we have such a low density of population to begin with. Sure. If you want to look at someplace like bad, look at the San Fernando Valley or Dallas, Texas outbreak five, six years ago. Not much like COVID, but it's, st it's still an issue. Uh, it's not like COVID at all. Oh, <laughs> COVID's far but worse. Your, it, it, your point is, is that it doesn't affect children as much, much like COVID. It doesn't affect children as much. Or, or making comparisons outside of our geography is also something that it's hard to draw conclusions of because it's not even the same type of mosquitoes. It's not the same habitat. We're, That's what I said. It's yeah. different. So it's hard to take evidence from some other place and transfer it to knowledge here because we Correct. have so few cases to begin with. Correct. And this all, this all just plainly ignores the whole principle of nuisance control of mosquitoes that, that is obviously a quality of life issue that I would think most most folks would agree would be uh, not arguing at against least quality a part of life of that, issue. and I think it's very rare that we actually, um, you know, if we went back through and looked at the applications that we specified were directly in correlation for West Nile findings. Predominantly, those are based upon our actual uh, surveillance and assessments of either infected mosquitoes or infected birds or human cases, and predominantly those have occurred within the metropolitan area. We're a function of human population when it comes to whether or not West Nile virus uh, is going to be a, a huge issue. You mentioned Dallas, um, Dallas and Tarrant County specifically. They had a massive, extreme West Nile virus outbreak in 2012 within their urban area. They had to get a court order to issue an option for aerial spraying to limit the amount of West Nile virus transmission that occurred. You look at Zika virus in the Miami Beach area, they had the Centers for Disease Control, the state of Florida, coming in and ordering that the resources of aerial application were not available at, their, at that time. They engaged upon those in an emergency type situation. So I think an ounce of prevention in this situation far exceeds a knee-jerk reaction just to say a blanket statement that there, there is no, no cause or there, there is some reason just to say, well, we shouldn't do this. So um, to your points, I, I just could not disagree more. Well, I'm not, I'm not saying there's not a comfort factor, that's for sure. I'm saying it's very hard to take the data from 2012 in Dallas and apply it to Fargo. You have 7 million plus people But you in can Dallas. take the stories along with it that you've got a, a municipality that had almost no mosquito control capacity. Dallas, it's, you know, everyone thinks it's fairly arid. It's relatively dry comparatively to, to elsewhere had huge cases, several hundred over the course of a couple days, weeks, that had occurred there. Whether those were neuroinvasive or, or not, I don't care. The reality was is the public health infrastructure failed at that time and caused essentially a human-caused disaster. And the only remedy at that instance was an aerial application of insecticide. So, you know, that is, that is what, was, what has been shown time and time again to be the last resort. And what we have shown, if you've listened to any of our previous discussions, aerial and any sort of adult control application is very most the last option that we will undertake. We do abundance of surveillance. We look at disease. We do interface with the North Dakota Department of Health to look at human cases. And quite frankly, all steps and all rationalization we've undertaken in spades. I'm not arguing against much of that. I'm I'm arguing that it's hard to tell if you're going to get any effect or not when you have so few people that you're treating and so, and it just isn't. And kids get it. You obviously had it. Teenagers get it worse than small children. And they have headaches and they have fever and they're sick. They get over it. And um, it's really something where you can have personal responsibility. If you're going to be outside after dusk, you don't do that. You wear permethrin impregnated clothing. You wear, you use DEET. There's a whole lot of things that people can do on a level of personal care, personal responsibility, that they can pay for themselves and take care of them. And you don't have to spray everywhere where some people don't like to spray because of the unknown toxic effects of permethrin. And you, you have people that um, go from there. Yeah, please. You got last.
Here, Rob, oh, the folks at home can hear. Are going to be at a, these residual sprays are going to be at a significantly higher rate than if they were at, in ULV applications. Yeah, I understand that. And so if you, if you put that on every homeowner to go out there and go make these applications, number one, the rate in themselves are going to be substantially higher, so you have a residual effect that's going to, that's going to have effects on pollinators, not just during that time frame, but it's going to carry over for several hours, possibly days, if you're using a product like bifenthrin. Now, if you use permethrin in the ULV sense, those products are broken down immediately before the sun comes up the next day. They have no effect. If you go spray in the middle of the day with a permethrin at 0.007 pounds, which is the max labeled rate, whether it be through a ground machine or an aerial machine, which delivers the same endpoint, those products aren't persistent in our environment and they're not persistent for pollinators. So if you're, if you're advocating for residual sprays, in fact, you're gonna have the opposite effect. You're gonna hurt pollinators more than if you were to use it in a ULV sense. Does that- I'm not advocating for residual spray. I'm advocating that people can do for themselves if they're at high risk. But when you're talking about a backpack spray, in the backyard, that's what you said during your opening statement, that's a residual spray, that's what that is. That would be what you would do as a vector no, control. No, it's the same thing. If you were to use the product, whether you go buy it at the store or wherever you find the permethrin, you go spray it in your bushes or wherever in the backyard, that's gonna be a substantially higher rate than it would be in a ULV application. I, One acre of ULV would be equivalent to treating three children's head with lice. Not the same situation when you're talking about a residual spray. Vastly different. Okay. I want to take just one moment now that it came up. Uh, permethrin is exhaustively studied, not only for the, uh, by the Environmental Protection Agency as a licensed registered insecticide, it's also registered by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration as a pharmaceutical, and in fact is listed by the World Health Organization as a, one of its essential medicines. Quite frankly, it is used predominantly in a medical setting for the treatment of head lice on infants or up to children as young as I think six months of age or somewhere along that lines. Definitely not a medical doctor. This is not medical advice, but it certainly is used uh, in lice treatment, both pubic head and body lice. Um, widely used in domestic uh, animals and livestock. Um, you apply this to your dogs, you apply this to dairy cattle, big beef cattle. Uh, you are looking at uh, a number of different cash crops that are made for human consumptions that a bulk of your permethrin or pyrethroid um, consumption is coming predominantly from these crops that you're consuming directly out of your refrigerator or your, your grocery store aisle. 36 crops listed for human consumption, pesticide application right applications are hundredfold more than what we're applying. It can be applied on your apples. It can be applied on your uh, Brussels sprouts. So, um, it is widely understood that permethrin is considered safe and is one of the uh, best insecticides for both uh, for mosquito control applications and for human health when it comes to uh, the potential for uh, some of these invasive pests that will live on your body. Hey, Ben. Yep. I'm wondering if we could move. We've got, you know, it's about 530 and we've got some others. That would be super. So we have a question from a resident. Sure. Uh, thank you very much for the information. How many species of mosquitoes are able to carry West Nile virus in our region? And are the counts of the species taken into consideration in the, de in the decision tree to decide whether to aerial spray? Yes, and hopefully this mic is live. Can you hear me? All right. Um, approx well, the, the challenge when you say that uh, how many species of mosquitoes carry West Nile virus in, in this region, it really becomes a statistical kind of thing. Uh, our predominant nuisance mosquitoes is called Aedes vexin. It is what is considered a low, uh, um, low capacity or a, 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 a one or two percent likely chance of of being able to transmit West Nile virus to a person. We see those numbers of mosquitoes 90 to, you know, 90 to one in our trap counts. Um, predominantly when you're out in, the, in the, the yard on any given night, when you're getting bitten, it's an 80s vexin. So when you're talking about maybe a one, two, three percent chance of a, 
of that particular species being able to transmit, you're dealing with a population that's into the hundreds of millions uh, in, in our region. So um, the key thing is it, it's really what mosquitoes are gonna bite a bird and then turn around, gain that, that infection, and then be able to transmit that, transmit that to a human. When you talk about specific human vectors of West Nile virus, our predominant one that we have in Cass County in this region is called Culix tarsalis. Um, the genus Culix um, is, is very widely known to be a major carrier disease in North America. Um, you see Culix tarsalis transmit that Western equine encephalitis, St. Louis encephalitis, uh, all our uh, neuroinvasive type uh, situations. And um, we have approximately on a four or five species in genus Culix that we find in our region. Um, Culix tarsalis is, uh, they call the uh, Western irrigation ditch mosquito, and are hugely abundant and a major driver of human West Nile infection in, in our region. So our surveillance is inclusive of that, and we actually have uh, a specialized surveillance program purely for the uh, detection of both those mosquitoes but also uh, of whether or not they are carrying the pathogen. So we track the overall abundance across our network of 40 trap locations that we do surveillance on a daily, uh, on a daily basis, but we're also doing an additional 10 to 12, uh, what we call live traps to actually uh, do an assessment on whether or not we're seeing mosquitoes that have currently have an infection. So uh, those, uh, those types of situations do fall into the mix. But really, um, when you start talking about nuisance control and disease control, those avenues kind of split. So uh, when we get into you know, our nuisance level thresholds and things, we have a very, very clear uh, and distinct flow chart and tabulation of, of how that works, dedicated thresholds, and quite frankly, some of the best surveillance in North America uh, to make those indications. I just want to make a comment as a homeowner, is this live? Yes, sir. As a homeowner and taxpayer, uh, I live on in Prairie Wood Drive, and uh, I, we moved to Fargo in 1997, and uh, the gentleman discussed the comfort factor, which for me and my neighbors is so important. Uh, I can recall the first eight, 10 years, we, we couldn't go outside. Uh, granted, we've been in a wet cycle the last 20, 25 years, but uh, I, I don't have time, I barely have time to start the grill. And uh, I wanna kudos, say kudos to Vector Control for whatever, it seems like the last eight, 10 years, that's not an issue anymore. Uh, I mean, granted, there's a few times where we've had to go in early, but uh, the comfort factor is huge for uh, myself and, and my neighbors in, in Prairie Wood. Thank you. Appreciate your kind words, sir. Do you want a microphone or do you want to stand up at the podium? You're more than welcome. Sure. First of all, I want to make sure to uh, let you know that my name is Bridget Riedel. I am a, a uh, taxpayer as well as a citizen of rural Cass County. I live in Hunter. And for those who may feel that they don't want vector control to control their mosquitoes, send them to my place. They can spray all they'd like because we have a plethora where I live. Thank you. Thank you very kindly to Vector Control for all the work that you do on our behalf in Cass County. We truly appreciate it in those rural areas. Sometimes we're forgotten by the Metro, but we have a voice as well. Again, for property owners and taxpayers too. There's a couple things I'd like to make sure to talk about this evening. I also prepared remarks. And the first thing I'd like to do is introduce you to my family. See, this family photo was taken at my son's wedding, but you'll notice there's someone who's missing from that photo. And that would be my dad. The reason is, the West Nile virus killed my dad. Now it's not that the vector control district where he lives did not do their work. They did. But what I am telling you is that irregardless of previous information presented tonight, West Nile does indeed do more than give you a headache, make you tired, and that you eventually recover. Because please understand, I know the consequences of West Nile the same as any other virus. And we do indeed have the opportunity as citizens to control what's going on. So I'd like to take you back to the summer of 2012. 
Can anybody recall the weather in that particular year? I can, because I've looked. Number one, the summer of 2012 was rather dry. Now, as Ben mentioned earlier, the mosquito that carries the West Nile virus, the Culex variation of that mosquito, actually is more prevalent in dry years than we have in wet years. And so we see a higher incident rate. Again, I've also worked with the Department of Health, and I have looked at their numbers and statistics. And we have higher incident rates in those years. We also have a higher death rate in those years. So that infection rate was fairly high. My dad is, was a farmer. He was 58 years old at the time that he was infected during wheat harvest late summer. He did not know that what would come was six months of ICU, that the West Nile virus is literally a portal for your body for other problems to happen. And so in those six months, he suffered a heart attack, a stroke, kidney failure, a neuropathy, you know, much like a diabetic neuropathy, French polio, which is known as Guillain-Barre. He lost the ability to swallow. He lost the ability to be off of a respirator for longer than 24 hours. He could no longer walk. And at 58 years old, reeling, realizing that he would be forever a respirator as well as a feeding tube patient, he chose to shut those machines off. So therefore, he's now missing in any of our family pictures. Now I realize that for most of us, West Nile is simply something that we'll get over, and the general population does. My family felt that way as well until we were affected through dad. Now 5% of the population, even if we had a vaccine, would not respond to the vaccine. Now we can vaccinate horses, just as was stated earlier, but we don't have a human, pop, human vaccine. Why? We live in an incredibly litigious society. Most people, even if they have the chance to survive, it would not work. And I can tell you that having been in the ICU with dad for six months, of the other nine adult patients who ranged in age from 22 to 85, all of them would have been happy to give it a try. So I want to make sure that we also understand that homeowners we can take action, and we do. We drain water. We make sure that there's nothing standing in our yards. We spray in addition to what Cass County Vector Control does for us. But it's not perfect. And I can guarantee you that there's plenty of other people who would not take that responsibility or that cost to take care of it themselves. See, my dad is no longer here to enjoy his six children, his lovely wife, and his nine grandchildren because of the West Nile virus. I want to make sure that this county continues to spray actively for mosquito control, whether a nuisance or whether a public health effect. We've all heard the problems when Zika virus came to Miami, and we might be more sparsely populated, but I don't think that any one of us matters any less than they did in Miami. Therefore, I want to tell you that our lives depend on us to continue to do the right thing. I appreciate all that vector control does for us, Thank you for that. Thank you for the time to speak this evening. And hope things move forward. Thank you. Sorry to hear about your family's loss. Um, we have three people, Ben, on the sure. line. Yep, go ahead. Um, we'll go Noel Harden, Joseph Allen, Allison Wallace. So, Noel, I'll turn it over to you. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Yep, loud and clear. Wonderful. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you, uh, Mr. Prather, and everyone else who's putting these information sessions together. Um, I think it's really important, and I've learned a lot, and I appreciate um, especially being able to join remotely as I'm a single mom uh, with my kid running around here someplace. He might pop in at some point. Um, I did put a few questions into the chat, um, follow-ups from questions that I have had previously. Um, I think that my number one question that I have right now, um, you know, you've talked a lot about the history of the program and things that have happened in the past. I would really like you to look to the future and identify some specific steps that you are going to take to mitigate the impact that spraying is having on 
not just the monarchs, but also other pollinators, as well as bees, which are specifically um, warned about in the label for the product that you use. So I would love to hear about some specific steps that you will take um, and things that might include looking at the timing of spraying, looking at a more targeted application, um, and as well, looking at whether Moorhead could potentially opt out of the aerial application altogether. Thank you. Yes. And she makes some great points there. You know, certainly, um, you know, we, we want to, we want to learn from from every every day. You know, as human beings, our our goal is to adapt or die. So the the basic point that I, I want to make just to start off with is that we don't have a crystal ball to look into the future to tell us what the end of August 2021 is going to be like. Um, I can't tell you whether we're going to have West Nile. I can't tell you whether or not we're going to have severe nuisance conditions. Uh, we are specifically driven by the data of our trap collections. Uh, we're specifically driven by the data of our human and mosquito incidents of West Nile virus. So those are the key indicators. We don't have a single day on a calendar that we usually peg in to say, okay, we're gonna spray on that, on that particular moment. So there is a, a little bit of, a, of an asterisk on a lot of these things because quite frankly, I couldn't tell you what the first week of July is gonna look like, the first week of May is gonna look like and so on. So realistically, we're, we're staring into something of an abyss of, of potential. Moving forward, you know, definitely there, there are a number of options. And, and I think we've demonstrated uh, a number of times here today that, that really um, our whole protocol, our whole process uh, really does uh, incorporate all entities. Uh, the city of Moorhead, the city of Fargo, city of West Fargo have input and say on whether or not an application occurs uh, and how it, you know, whether or not it, it goes forward at all. And that has been a part and parcel of our process for the better part of, of 20 years. Looking at the specifics of the uh, actual timing of the application and some of those other other type scenarios, that gets down a, a technical path that that certainly we are looking at. Um, specifically, staging or timing of the aircraft is has its own challenges given that we're dealing with a, a Class C airspace around Hector International Airport, uh, but we're certainly not taking any of that options off the table. Um, we have to bear in mind too that there are fairly stringent temperature and wind speed constraints for us um, in terms of uh, legality of whether we can apply these products under certain conditions. So, so we have a fairly narrow window and a, a tolerance that, that we are obliged to, um, to follow in those instances. But I think um, for us moving forward, um, you know, definitely we do have uh, a number of items that, uh, that basically terminate. You know, the very last option is to say, well, maybe we just don't aerial spray at this time. Uh, we have anywhere from eight or 10 different choices that I've had, um, that I've laid out to, that are gonna be discussed in the future as necessary, but um, definitely um, when it comes to the future decision-making, um, there is a political component to this. And, and certainly um, if the city of Moorhead were to elect to opt out for an aerial application, that would be under their own ambition. Um, it is purely my uh, recommendation and my assessment made through an abundance or a huge cacophony of, of different uh, tools, samples, and analysis uh, and experience to recommend those sprays. But I can say very, very easily uh, that in the coming season, especially at the end of, end of August 2021, that there's going to be some discussions um, very clearly pointed to that. You had a statement, Mr. Dell? Yeah. First of all, I want to thank Noelle for joining us this evening. I've, I've exchanged some emails with her and we've had lots of conversations. I appreciate her feedback and everything like that. I will kind of uh, reiterate what Ben is saying. You know, the city of Fargo, uh, city of Moorhead, city of West Fargo, they have the no-go go at the end. It's not Ben saying, we're going to do this, the county's going to do this, they're leading this. Um, they provide us the details. They provide us the oversight as far as conditions, everything like that with the... Uh, aerial applicator, it's really coming down to the city decision. And that's that's where we come into play with our elected officials, discussing this with our elected officials and, and our department director heads of, of what we want to do. And so at any time, anybody can opt out or opt in. So again, this isn't uh, necessarily a Cass County thing. They, they provide the, what you might call contract resources, 
the experts to, to move this forward, it's it's really a no go or go from the cities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Catch, just one last moment. The the catch twenty two when we're looking at that end of of August, early September. Um, I had a slide that's in there and that's in the notes. If you can look, uh, the primary human West Nile virus transmission uh, interval really is the start of August through the middle of September throughout throughout the United States, and that is very much our case here in North Dakota. We have a predominant number of, uh, in Minnesota, we have a predominant number of West Nile human infections that occur right in that same interval. So uh, there are definitely challenges at hand um, when, when we're talking about uh, making blanket, you know, uh, decisions that, that could affect human health. So um, more questions, we can, we can move on. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, there's a follow-up from Noel in the chat here that says time, timing of day, not just on the calendar. Um, with that, uh, we'll go to Joseph Allen and then Allison Wallace. Joseph, are you on? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm right here. Great, the mic's yours. Uh, again, I, uh, I put in several items into the chat and uh, maybe those can be followed up separately, but one of my biggest concerns is that on the specimen label sheet, uh, it's indicated that it's uh, desirable to uh, apply this this particular product, this pesticide, insecticide, um, either in the in the in the cool hours of the night or the very early morning. And a lot of places have elected to go at least two hours after sunset, give the uh, pollinators a little time to take cover. Uh, and and hopefully uh, be less likely to uh, to be killed. But um, it, it, it seems as though uh, a little flexibility on on the part of vector control in getting these things to happen later. I realize that that Ben's got a lot of reasons why things can't change. But uh, uh, I feel as though uh, we could we could save ourselves a lot of trouble uh, and certainly protect our environment if we could just move that uh, application time uh, much later in the evening. Uh, in fact, uh, after dark would be preferable. Well, I appreciate that, that comment. And you know, certainly that is something we're looking at. The, the one point that I'd like to make, and not to be argumentative, uh, but really we are aiming for, as you mentioned, conditions which mosquitoes are effective. Now, the challenge with those labels, uh, the pesticide application labels that are, are the law of the land when it comes to mosquito abatement, they're applying one label to a product that is supposed to work from Fargo, North Dakota to uh, Key Largo, Florida. So when you're saying cool hours, cool hours of, of the night, um, those are relative terms. So we're looking at essentially atmospheric physics problems. We're talking weather, we're talking inversions, we're talking wind speeds and dew points and temperatures and some of those things. And those become highly variable. Um, I think that my favorite anecdote that I always use in, in these discussions is, uh, we've all sat around a fire on a hot summer night and mosquitoes have been up since two or three in the morning when you're, or will, will be buzzing in your ear that whole time on a hot, sticky, stale kind of night. You go into, uh, you know, maybe the very next day, you know, you have a daytime high at 80 degrees again, but then you have an overnight low that drops into maybe the upper 50s. Your dew points trail off, your wind speeds change, your dynamics of what's happening in the air is affecting what this cold-blooded mosquito is having to adapt to. So there is variation in, in terms of behavior and activity when it comes to that. So that is something that, that always is a challenge in that, yes, it would be perfect if we could spray when we were ready to spray and when it would be ideal, but really we need to target the application so that they are the most effective for mosquitoes. That being said, we are looking at, you know, again, we're threading the needle through some pretty tight tolerances with all of these things. And if there, there are other things that we're able to do, we, we definitely will take a look at it. Thank you, Ben. And say, Joseph, if you wanna put your email in the chat, we can capture the other questions and then I can share them with uh, Ben Prather. So um, uh, I've put uh, I put uh, several comments in the chat already. If you want to just kind of scroll back, I, I think you can find them. Um, I, I think another major issue has to do with uh, you know obviously everyone's scared of West Nile virus, 
but last year, uh, 2020, I don't believe we had any cases in Cass County, let alone fatalities. Uh, certainly, there's some concern that we, we monitor that, we stay on top of it, but why are we using aerial spraying if we haven't tested mosquitoes to be actually infected with West Nile virus? Well, again, I, that, that's a good point, and that, that's something that is constantly monitored for, and we're constantly doing um, surveillance to detect uh, not only the species of mosquitoes that are ca uh, capable of transmitting the virus, we're also doing assessments directly on those mosquitoes to determine whether or not there is virus present in them. So there are a lot of different, we're talking specifics on uh, essentially triggers um, that, that have a, 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 you know, an action that moves forward. This particular application uh, was, was based predominantly for nuisance. So we kind of have to divide our train of thought between what is a disease type scenario and what is a nuisance type scenario. And sometimes they overlap and intermingle, but the August 26th application specifically was dedicated for, for nuisance. When we start talking about West Nile, and as I did during that interval as well, that is again, peak West Nile transmission season for us is pretty much the end of August. And quite frankly, when we're looking purely at surveillance results, we're, we're collecting hundreds of thousands of mosquitoes a week. That is absolutely a drop in the bucket compared to the tens of millions, the hundreds of millions of mosquitoes that are out there. So we're really taking shots in the dark and whether or not we see a positive pool of mosquitoes, whether we see a positive bird, dead bird, so on. Uh, but I assure you that type of surveillance is built in to, to the mechanics of, of, our, of our reasoning and our flow chart for those applications. You are absolutely 100% correct. There were no positive humans uh, with West Nile virus in Cass or Clay counties in 2020, but we did have positive people in Trail County and Grand Forks County. We had early, we had indicators uh, down in Richland County, which is Wapaton, uh, Trail County, I believe, and a lot of counties around us that were showing uh, either bird, avian infection, or mosquito infection. So that kind of starts triggering you know, a little bit of a regional kind of call to readiness. So um, it, it is less of a, of a trigger to say, oh, we gotta spray now, more of again to, to more or less call us to action to say, all right, we need to be observant of this. Just because we have a zero result uh, doesn't mean that we're not missing, missing some point of that. But um, we do have dedicated thresholds for, for nuisance on that equation. And disease is, is something that uh, at its time is, is separate. Uh, could I ask one more question? Sure. Uh, the, the other question would be, uh, uh, in the last vector meeting, Ben uh, commented about uh, losing a good uh, number of his staff towards the August, September timeframe when uh, a lot of them went back to school. Uh, and that uh, made aerial spraying uh, one of the, the last resorts that he had in that he couldn't man all the uh, um, uh, trucks that we would do with ground spray. It would seem like targeted ground spray uh, in areas where we had West Nile virus confirmed would be uh, more valuable than uh, trying to make everybody uh, more comfortable rather than using uh, uh, personal protection, which people could certainly do, and, uh, and, and, and avoid this uh, mass uh, destruction of what has now uh, headed toward being an endangered species of monarch butterflies, let alone all of the other beneficial insects that get killed uh, as, uh, with, the, with the mosquito control that we're trying to do. Um, you know, they, it, it goes through the whole food chain with, uh, you know, birds that want to eat the, the insects and, and so on up the line. Uh, and, and people that, uh, that have gardens, people that are trying to uh, improve the number of pollinators and, and protect not only bees, uh, which, which are measured as far as the toxicity there, but also uh, many species of butterflies um, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to be comfortable, but it's also nice to have a little bit of beauty in the world. So uh, maybe we could uh, uh, use ground spray uh, targeted application rather than wholesale uh, spraying uh, in an aerial fashion, uh, which there's no control over. 
Well, I appreciate appreciate those comments. Um, you know, the the big thing when we're we're discussing this particular application and, and any any um, adult control application, we're looking at again identified thresholds that are established and approved. We're getting those notifications, and and in this particular instance, um, in um, in August of, of 2020, we had very very detailed documentation that it wasn't any one hot spot. Um, if there was a hot spot, it was Cass and Clay counties. We saw record setting or 10 year records set in a number of our trapping locations inside and around the Fargo Moorhead metropolitan area. We were 10 times what we would normally consider above our threshold uh, level. We saw uh, tons and tons of mosquitoes. So we, we did our diligence when it when it came to that. Um, targeted sprays are something that we've always uh, aspired to do. Um, quite frankly, our geography makes that bigger challenge. And that's why we do some of this population modeling to see if we can't see the trees from the forest, so to speak. Um, but from most indications in our analysis, that is very kind of preliminary. Um, we, we did show that widespread, uh, a widespread aerial application was, was gonna be the best tool that we had available to us at, at that time. And I'd also just wanna mention that the difference between an aerial pesticide spray of permethrin and a ground or truck mounted spray of permethrin is basically nil. There is almost no difference other than maybe we're spraying a 20 droplet, uh, 20 micron droplet out of a truck and we're spraying a 55 micron droplet out of the aircraft. So it sinks a little faster. So beyond that, we're talking, you know, very small, very tiny nuances in the actual products that's going out, the rates and so forth, uh, they're all insecticides. We could be spraying NFM prox or, you know, any of these other things, the effect would, would be the same. But certainly uh, looking into the future, we're, we're evaluating every option we have. One last question. One more, okay, Allison Wallace, Dr. Wallace, are you on? Yeah, I am. Uh, sorry, I don't have my video, but can you hear me? Yes, we can, I'm clear. Okay, thank you so much for all the information. This is really helpful. And I'm really glad that there's so many people, I don't know how many people are here today, but you know, I know that there's a lot of people that are concerned about health and the environment and they go hand in hand. And so I appreciate all the people that are working together to try to maximize both. Uh, so um, I, you kind of answered to some extent the question that I had um, about are the counts of the specific species that carry West Nile taken into consideration in the decision tree. So I'm gonna just, um, maybe maybe qualify that a little bit more. And I don't know if you have this on the top of your head, but during that, um, during the West Nile, you know, danger period in August, how many times was an aerial spray done? If you happen to know that information or even, you know, approximately, and how many of those sprays was it predominantly because of concern for West Nile um, possibility of versus nuisance? Yeah, and I, you know, to break that out between the two it, it is a bit of a challenge. I would say October, September applications are pretty, especially early September, are probably very evenly split between um, nuisance and disease. And that correlates to what we see in our, our trap counts. If I have my slides back, I can actually show you um, the times we aerial sprayed and the times we ground sprayed over the past six years um, and just kind of maybe walk through through that, and that's kind of, that's in the packet, it's in the information there. Um, definitely uh, take a look. Um, it looks like a big calendar view and it has some some lit up um, um, different, oh, we're trying to connect to our, our PC here, but um, during that time, you know, it, it really is a 50-50 split, and, and those are based on two things, the nuisance, nuisance track, whether or not we're seeing our threshold counts uh, for um, discomfort, or whether we're seeing these indicators of West Nile virus be that positive mosquitoes, positive, um, uh, positive uh, human cases, positive birds, and so forth. And let me just run into, here we go. So looking into the past six years, uh, back to 2016, you can see that August, September, we, we have less applications. We generally have less nuisance type situations, but I'd have to look at the specifics of each one to say, which one of these were West Nile and which one of these were not. You can see in that same week uh, in previous years, 2017, 2016, so on, um, that we did have aerial and ground fogs uh, that occurred during that time and had 
uh, seemingly no no problems there, nothing reported to us at that point. So is this, are these data like available? Yeah, this is yeah. uh, the, the sprays. Uh, we, of course, we publish online. They're on our Facebook page. They're on our website, uh, Fargo, West Fargo, Moorhead, usually retweet our, our tweets. But this information packet um, is, yeah. is available online. This whole, this whole conversation and the, the uh, I have a 90 minute presentation that I gave at the city of Fargo uh, last week that goes into detail about the, the idea of uh, what we did, why we did it. And I talk at length about the staging and those, those applications um, that were performed in those times. But if you want the notes from tonight that is inclusive of the notes from the previous one, um, go ahead and go to that website and you can, uh, our, our Cass County website, and you can download all of those notes or all of these notes as well. Okay, just took a picture of that, thank you. Yep, and um, then again, the City of Fargo um, YouTube channel has uh, my full 90 minutes uh, of, uh, of presentations from uh, two weeks ago. This uh, presentation tonight is being recorded as well. Yes, so that will be available. Yeah, Mr. Molly's point that this is also recorded uh, this evening as well. Uh, thank you, Allison. Is there anything else? No, not at this time. Thanks okay. a lot. I'm, I hope we have continued dialogue, so thank you. Thank you. Say, there's one more question in the chat, Ben, if that's sure. all right. Maybe we could address that and then close. Is that fair? Yep. We're after six. Thank you for, uh, for doing that. Uh, final. Uh, you mentioned about 12 people involved in the current decision-making process related to an aerial spray. Do any of them have expertise in understanding the nuances of West Nile migration, like the physician who spoke earlier, or expertise of the potential negative impacts on pollinators? What factors are these 12 people considering, especially considering externalized costs like pollinator loss? I think it's important to, to just say this just once and for, for all time. We're not anti-pollinator. We're not anti-bee. We're not anti-monarch. My vector control board, uh, our, our group of, of government officials who I report to, have no interest in, in, in trying to harm non-target organisms. And, and quite frankly, we have these protocols set up so that we're using these applications in such a way that they're dedicated to do the absolute best for mosquito control with as minimal impact that we can have on non-targets. When it comes to uh, the expertise of the board, we do have a, uh, a PhD entomologist on the vector control board. Uh, we have years of, of experience on the board, uh, medical doctor, um, a doctor of dentistry who has five or six years of mosquito control experience, uh, myself, uh, over a decade of, of this particular job. And we regularly interface with folks at NDSU, um, Dr. Par Paul, Paul Carson, uh, who uh, we've seen a lot in the uh, recent weeks of, of COVID issues, who has been um, dealing with the Fargo-Moorhead Task Force and, and dealing with COVID, actually did, does and has a lot of research on West Nile virus in North Dakota and in our region. So uh, I've guest lectured with him on a, on a number of occasions. So. Uh, when we're looking at the the pool of expertise uh, that that we have in this community, it's it is large. Um, but quite frankly, those triggers are bright flashing lights. Like when we have positive pools, when we start seeing, of course, human infections, uh, it's fairly universal throughout North America that interventions will occur. So regardless of talent, regardless of education, when you start seeing sickness in people, you start seeing indicating factors, either weather or mosquitoes. Uh, those are best management practices that are established. We have a West Nile reduction plan on our website. It's also included in the slide deck if you download it today. But uh, towards the end, um, it's like slide probably 78 or something to that nature, goes into detail about those situational uh, conditions where we jump into a new state of readiness. And uh, really that, that really spells kind of our doctrine when we go into to West Nile season. And, and that again is a, is a, a best management practice that, uh, that is a, a standard in our industry. Super, thanks Ben. You know, and I just wanna say thank you, Cass County Vector Control uh, uh, for coming over to Moorhead and presenting this along with you, Ben Dow. Um, you know, one thing that's evident to me is the high level of care and concern for others. That's a good thing. Everybody involved uh, cares about others here and that's what we're doing. That reflects a strong community. So thank you both.
Yep, and we just want to thank everybody for joining in tonight and uh, taking some time out of your evening to, to spend some time with us. Uh, I learn something from every time I talk to Ben, and I, I learn a lot every time I'm talking to the residents about this issue. So uh, we want to thank everybody, thank the City of Moray for hosting tonight, and uh, we're open for any questions. This doesn't end right here this evening. This is going to continue forward, and we're, we're going to continue with open sessions as the uh, summer goes on, because I think it's important that people see the data side of it as well and when we're in the trenches of dealing with mosquito control. So thanks again, everybody, and uh, I hope everybody has a great and safe evening.